Hello and welcome. Today I'll be sharing some tips and tricks for ICP OES analysis. It would be absolutely impossible for us to cover everything in 30 minutes. So I'll focus on the points I see people struggle with most often. We'll dig into both hardware and data concerns. Before you can be expected to troubleshoot, you really need to understand what's happening to get from your sample to your data. The standard ICP OES analysis process looks something like this. The liquid sample is picked up by an auto sampler. Then the peristaltic pump and associated tubing delivers that sample to your nebulizer, which converts the sample to an aerosol using a stream of argon called the nebulizer gas, or neb gas. The spray chamber separates out the smallest droplets from that aerosol and sends them to the plasma where they're desolvated or dried. The plasma then vaporizes and ionizes the analytes, and that ionization process gives off light at certain wavelengths specific to each analyte. The amount of light emitted is proportional to the concentration of the analyte, so once you've calibrated your spectrometer, it can use those measurements to report a concentration which will be displayed in the software and then you can print it or report it as you need to. One of the first steps in any analysis is getting the sample to the plasma. A critical piece of this process is the peristaltic pump, which is used to deliver a constant flow of sample to the plasma. If your peristaltic pump isn't delivering a constant flow, then you'll have problems, so we need to talk about the factors that can affect that flow. First, you need to choose the right tubing type for your matrix. I'm talking about the peristaltic pump tubing here. Most labs use PVC, but depending on the solvent you use, solvent flex, silicone, or Viton might actually be more appropriate. It's always a good idea to verify the solvent compatibility of materials if you aren't sure, and there's numerous resources available for that. Next, you must be sure that your tubing is attached to the pump in the correct orientation which you can see at the bottom left corner of this slide. The curved arrow indicates the rotation of the pump head, and the straight arrows indicate the flow path of the liquid. If you hook your drain tubing up in reverse of what you see here, the spray chamber will fill with liquid and your plasma will go out. Just about everyone has hooked up tubing incorrectly at least once. It's a very common problem, even among seasoned ICP veterans when they're in a hurry or not paying attention. Once your tubing is hooked up correctly, you need to adjust the tension on it until you see a steady flow. You should do this with the nebulizer gas turned off, so the flow of that gas doesn't pull the sample through the flow path. For this step, we only want to look at what the pump itself is doing. I recommend introducing air bubbles into the flow path by pulling the auto sampler probe or sample tubing in and out of a liquid several times. It could be just deionized water. Once the bubbles have made it past the pump head, loosen the tension on the clamps, highlighted here, until the bubbles stop flowing. Then tighten them until the flow of the bubbles is smooth. You don't want to over-tighten the tensioning clamps, though. This can inhibit or even stop the flow completely and cause premature wear on the tubing. Maintaining the tubing itself is critical. It is a consumable. Keep in mind that the typical lifetime of a piece of tubing is about 8 to 12 hours of operation. If you notice that it's flattened, you should definitely change it. Worn tubing will affect the precision or reproducibility of your results because the pump isn't able to deliver a constant flow. Let's talk about nebulizers. The purpose of the nebulizer is to convert your liquid sample into a fine aerosol by mixing it with the nebulizer gas. There are many different types of nebulizers. They're specialized for different applications and can vary in their efficiency, which is the amount of sample that goes all the way through to the plasma. They can also vary in the sample flow rates used and the sample compatibility. Depending on what ICP OES you're using and the types of analysis you do, your nebulizer will vary. Some labs use more than one type for different analyses. Others use one general nebulizer for many different purposes. Some commonly used nebulizer types are concentric, where the sample capillary is fully inside the gas stream, parallel path, where the sample stream and the gas stream run parallel to one another until they exit the tip of the nebulizer, 
Babington and V-groove, where the sample flows over the gas orifice, and then the cross flow, where sample and gas flows occur at right angles to one another. Because they allow for large diameter sample capillaries, the Babington, V-groove, and cross flow nebulizers are harder to clog and work well for high dissolved solid samples. Okay, so what about troubleshooting? All concentric nebulizers should self-aspirate, which means if you have the nebulizer gas flowing, liquid will flow through the tubing without pumping. If it doesn't, it's likely damaged or at least partially, if not completely, plugged. When you install a new nebulizer, you want to make note of back pressure. If you see it increase from that, it's an indication of plugging. If it's lower than expected, though, after post-cleaning reinstallation, for example, you may have a loose connection. If your nebulizer isn't displaying a normal spray, normal spray pattern, which is a uniform spray of fine droplets, it needs to be cleaned or replaced. If you're going to remove the nebulizer from the spray chamber to check the spray pattern, be sure to flush out any hazardous components before doing so. Aspirate only water to check the spray pattern. For the best view, you'll want to use a dark background. You're looking for spitting, large droplets, or the aerosol shooting off to one side. That would indicate a partial plug, and the nebulizer shouldn't be used until that is removed. Most importantly, be sure that you don't just look closely at performance when there's a problem. You need to be comfortable with what normal looks like before you can say what doesn't look right. Really though, the best approach is to prevent your nebulizer from getting clogged in the first place. The easiest way to do this is to make sure that you rinse with a clean blank solution after the last sample of your run for about 10 to 15 minutes. For the standard type of aqueous samples, that would be a dilute acid like your rinse solution. This is best done with the plasma still on and you'll also be rinsing the spray chamber as well which will prevent uh, any salts that are in the spray chamber from depositing on your nebulizer again after the instrument is shut down. When it's time to clean your nebulizer, you must use an appropriate cleaning procedure for your particular nebulizer. Not all nebs can be safely cleaned in the same way. Be aware that some of these procedures are very detailed and can require specialized equipment so that the nebulizer isn't damaged. One key thing to remember is never sonicate a quartz or glass nebulizer. The vibration from sonication will destroy the tiny sample capillary inside the nebulizer. In terms of ESI PFA nebulizers, you should never back flush them. You may, however, back flush the capillary leading up to it, just not the neb itself. Be aware that ESI offers nebulizer repair service for their PFA nebulizers, so just call them or email them if you want more information on that. Some manufacturers recommend soaking the nebulizer in a special cleaning solution such as RBS25 from Fluca. It's important that you always have a spare nebulizer, no matter what type of nebulizer you use. If your usual one is dirty or damaged, you can still run samples as long as you have an alternative. It can also be helpful for figuring out if a problem that you're having is linked to a specific nebulizer, but this only works if your nebulizer spare is in good condition. Remember, if you aren't sure how to clean your specific nebulizer, consult the manufacturer for instructions. Often, the instructions come packaged with the nebulizers, so be sure you don't just throw away all the packaging without reading it first. The next major component in the sample introduction system is the spray chamber, which plays a large role in conditioning the aerosol produced by the nebulizer. The spray chamber generally removes larger droplets, greater than about 20 microns or so, and reduces the aerosol concentration so you don't overload the plasma. Too much aerosol will cool the plasma and increase your matrix interferences. The spray chamber also reduces the turbulence of the nebulization process and smooths out small pulsations from the peristaltic pump. You should never see the aerosol in the spray chamber pulse. This will lead to high RSDs and indicates a problem with either the nebulizer or the pump tubing. You should also never see droplets cling to the surface of your spray chamber. This is an indication it's time for a cleaning. 
Of course, this can only really be easily seen if you're using a spray chamber that's made of glass or quartz. Be aware that some spray chambers have a specialized coating on the interior surface, and the manufacturer's instructions should always be followed for any cleaning to avoid damaging that. The last components of the sample introduction system are the injector and the torch. Most labs can use the setup that comes with their system, but if you're having problems with component lifetime or if you're interested in reducing sample flow to the plasma, there are alternatives. Injector designs can vary by both composition and internal diameter. There are injectors made from alumina, quartz, sapphire, and platinum. Some have narrower bores than others. Some bores taper towards the far end, and some are the same diameter all the way through. In terms of torch options, if you're analyzing a high salt or organic sample, standard torches won't last as long, so you should consider ones made from ceramic or silicon nitride, or in the case of organics, maybe a quartz torch that simply has more slots at the tip. Some alternative torch and in injector assemblies are made simply to minimize connections and O-rings. Before you start a run, you'll want to verify that your sample introduction components are in good condition and installed properly. A quick checklist can be seen on this slide. Always be on the lookout for bubbles in the sample line that could indicate a loose connection between components. This is particularly true if you're using an internal standard mixing tee. Sometimes those what look like bubbles are actually voids in the line and can be caused by a kink in some piece of tubing or a partial plug beginning to form. And what that really is, is a void created by the liquid trying to push past that obstruction in the line. So it's not always a leak. Another common issue is when your plasma either goes out unexpectedly or won't even light in the first place. So what are some common things that might cause that? First, it's important to distinguish which issue we're talking about. On the surface, not lighting and extinguishing quickly sound very similar, but they can have very different causes. If your plasma doesn't light at all, it's possible that gas flows aren't correct, or perhaps the argon isn't flowing because the tank is empty or a valve is off. An air leak can also keep the plasma from igniting. This can happen if a connection isn't tight or if O-rings need replacing. Also, if the torch has been recently flooded, or even recently cleaned, any residual liquid will cause problems with ignition. If, however, the plasma lights but goes out quickly or unexpectedly, it's important to observe when precisely it goes out. It might be helpful to discuss the ignition sequence to understand this better. The first thing that happens when you press the ignite button is the argon gases, plasma, auxiliary, and neb will all flow to purge out any air in the system. Next, the nebulizer flow will turn off. Then the ignition will take place, and there are a few seconds where the system allows the plasma to stabilize. After the stabilization time has passed, the nebulizer gas will turn back on, and the peristaltic pump will turn on. If the plasma ignites and goes out right when the nebulizer gas flow turns back on, this indicates an air leak. When you're checking and tightening the connections in your system, be careful not to over-tighten. Connections should be snug, but you don't want to crimp or break any components. So let's move on and discuss some issues your data might indicate. Okay, you've done all your maintenance and started your run, but there's a problem. The QC fails or your results are just not what you expected them to be. A QC failure is often what triggers a call that the instrument isn't working, but keep in mind if your instrument has sent similar intensities as it had in the past for the same solutions, such as your standards, it's not broken. If you can build a calibration curve for all or even just some elements, that indicates there's a problem with chemistry, sample introduction, method, peak or background positions, that kind of thing. This is when having good troubleshooting skills can really help. Let's take a look at, what a particular, at one particular data set as an example. When your QC fails, here are some questions to ask yourself. Is it all elements or just a few? If it's just a few, 
you need to give some thought as to what is different between the good elements and the bad elements. If all of the elements are off and by the same factor, this is usually an indication of a sample preparation error, such as an issue with pipetting or dilution. Here you see zinc and magnesium, along with several other analytes. They're failing, but lead is fine. If lead is not added separately from the other analytes, a pipetting or dilution error is unlikely. So this is still the same data with most of the elements showing QC out of range on the high side, except for lead. Most of the time, you'll run three replicates of each sample and look at the average of those results. But it's also helpful to see how those replicates compare to each other. Precision within sample replicates is a good troubleshooting tool. It confirms that the result you've obtained is repeatable and stable in the short term. Let's take a look at the RSDs for our example data. Assuming you have a reasonable signal, so we're ignoring blanks here, typical precisions are anything less than 2 to 3 percent. As a ballpark figure, figure, poor precision is greater than around 10 percent RSDs. So with that in mind, the failing elements have high RSDs, but again, lead is within a normal range. Poor precision can indicate your pump tubing needs to be replaced or the tension on it isn't correct. But let's take a look at some other causes of this. One other cause of poor RSDs is improperly set sample uptake, read delay, and washout times. These can be a large part of your sample to sample runtime and should be optimized carefully. Most labs will speed up the peristaltic pump to get the sample from the vial to the nebulizer as quickly as possible. But a higher pump speed means a higher liquid flow, and more liquid in the plasma cools it off. The temperature of the plasma is tied to how it ionizes your analytes. When optimizing your method, if you speed the pump up faster than the speed for data acquisition to get it to the nebulizer more quickly, it's important to now al allow enough stabilization time so that the temperature of the plasma is no longer changing when the results are read. This stabilization time is often referred to in a method as the read delay time. If you don't allow the plasma temperature to stabilize, you'll see poor precision for replicates. Let's look at how individual replicates can be used to troubleshoot sample introduction or method timing issues. If the intensities are increasing with each replicate, like in example one, this can indicate that you don't have a long enough sample uptake or read delay time, and the sample still getting to the plasma when you begin making measurements. Example 2 shows replicate signals decreasing with time. This can indicate your sample washout time is too short, and the previous sample is still rinsing out of the nebulizer and spray chamber when you begin making measurements for the next sample. When you see this, you'll want to check the concentration of the previous sample, look at washout times and the identity of the analytes. Beware though, not all elements wash out at the same rate. Silver, tungsten, tantalum, molybdenum, uranium, those are all among particularly difficult to wash out analytes, although there are others. Depending on your setup, a 100 ppb standard of tungsten, tantalum, or molybdenum could take 20 minutes or more to return to baseline. A reasonable default wash time is about 60 seconds between each sample. From there, you could monitor blanks and adjust as needed. Alternatively, you could conduct a washout study. To do this, you'll need a method with the elements you want to look at. This could be your normal analytical method. You'll also need a way to look at a continuous signal and a timer. First, you'll aspirate a blank and zero the signal. Next, you'll aspirate a standard and let the signal stabilize. Finally, you'll aspirate a blank again, starting the timer when you remove the probe from the standard, and you stop the timer when the signal gets back to your original baseline or at least to a level that you desire it to get down to. Keep in mind that it may not be necessary for you to get all the way back to zero. As long as the signal is low enough that it won't bias your samples to a point of concern, the washout time's fine. 
you'll want to enter the longest washout time from all of the analytes into your method as the wash time. Remember that washout times would possibly change if you change your sample introduction system or maybe if you begin cooling your spray chamber. You'll want to recheck washout times after you make any changes. There are some other important ways to reduce washout issues. You don't want to calibrate any higher than you need to, particularly for sticky standards like silver, molybdenum, tantalum, and tungsten. If you want to report to a higher limit, you can always run a linear range check standard at the end of your run to validate the upper reporting limit. You want to make sure that you rinse adequately before each sample or standard. And you want to watch for chemistry or pH changes with your rinse solution. So with standard acidic samples, for example, you'll wash with the same acid or acids as are in your samples. Sometimes it's helpful to use a higher concentration of those acids in your rinse solution than you do in your samples. You never want to change from acidic to basic matrices between samples and rinse solution. This can cause precipitation or salts to form, which can clog your sample introduction and bias your results. You want to make sure that you rinse long enough before recalibrating if you fail a QC check, at least 10 minutes. So right about now you're thinking, did she just say I had to wash for 10 minutes before analyzing my blank? Remember that all of your quantitative answers are relative to the blank. It's an absolutely critical part of your calibration. You need to know what your normal blank levels are. For this, you have to look at the raw counts, not the concentrations. If you see a change, can you think of a reason why that might have happened? Maybe you switched lots of acid or you've recently had maintenance done on your deionized water system. Keep in mind that even though your calibration might look linear, it could still be bad if the blank reads high due to carryover or contamination. In this slide, the curve type is linear through zero. The slope of this calibration curve is actually only being determined by the high calibration standard and the zero because it's being forced through the origin. The first four calibration standards are actually below the calibration line. That's because the calibration blank was contaminated and the intensity is being subtracted from all of the points, leading to a negative concentration for the first two standards. While you would get a more accurate result by not forcing the curve through zero, the real fix here is to clean up that blank contamination. When evaluating their calibration, many people only look at R squared to verify that it's over 0.995, for example. But that only evaluates how well the line fits the data. It doesn't evaluate bias or error in the calibration. In this example, R squared is over 0.9995, which you can see below the graph. But the 10 ppm QC, which is shown here as the last sample concentration, read back at 13 ppm, which is 130% of what was expected. A closer look at the calibration shows that the 10 ppm standard is reading at 12 ppm, and in fact, all of the lower level standards are reading high. Again, our equation is linear through zero, and the high standards are pretty much determining the slope along with the origin. Looking at another calibration equation, in this case weighted linear, applied to the same standards, you can see that this fits the calibration data better and will give you more accurate results. The standards are now reading much closer to what we would expect, and the 10 ppm QC is now reading 11 ppm instead of 13. Unlike R squared, Relative standard error, or residual error, is an actual statistical measure of the error or bias in each calibration point. It's a reporting requirement for all NELAC and TNI accredited laboratories. A percent RSE closer to zero indicates less error or bias in your calibration. Looking at your spectra during a run is another troubleshooting tool that can help you find problems. 
several of these peaks have positions and background points that are not properly placed, which means the intensities are not being properly recorded. The peak shown in these two screenshots is actually yttrium, which is being used as an internal standard. This means that the poor result from the bad peak position and background points on the left screenshot is affecting every analyte that uses it as an internal standard. So fixing this one peak, as you can see on the right hand screenshot, makes a huge effect on the uh, results that you see in your entire run. Think back to that bad QC data we saw earlier. You may have noticed that all of the elements that were reading high were off by approximately the same amount. When looking again at the RSDs, we saw that the RSDs for the yttrium internal standard is 9% too. This is bad. On that last slide, we saw that yttrium was one of the elements that had the peak position off, and the right background point was up on the shoulder of the peak, as shown here. It turns out that the difference between lead, which had good RSDs and good QC recoveries, and everything else that had bad QCs and bad RSDs, was that lead didn't use yttrium as an internal standard. So now we've fixed the yttrium peak and the background point positions have been corrected, and the reprocessed data looks much better. RSDs are now all under 4%, with most of them under 2%, and the QC recoveries are much closer to what we would expect, uh, with most of them passing. Unfortunately, they aren't all passing, so there are still some issues to be uncovered. Unfortunately, sometimes there's more than one mystery to be solved. We've covered a lot of ground, so here are some key points that I want you to take away from this. Remember that sample introduction component selection is based on your lab needs and your sample types. You always want to confirm care and cleaning instructions with the manufacturer of the component. If you remember nothing else from today, remember that good troubleshooting begins with looking at the raw intensity and examining the spectra. You should ensure that your calibration blank is really blank. I recommend you run several blank checks before the actual calibration blank, to ensure that the signal levels are low and stable. Perform a washout study of your highest standards or your samples and make sure that you're adequately rinsing out before each new sample or standard. Always examine your spectra for both peak position and background correction points, especially with a new method or new wavelengths. Limit your calibration range to what is sensible Spread your standards across that range and use an appropriate calibration equation. Don't calibrate higher than you need to, particularly with elements that take a long time to wash out. If you have problems with QCs passing or known samples, that doesn't mean your instrument is broken. You probably just have a blank contamination issue, a calibration issue, or perhaps an interference effect. And finally, you should always stay and observe the beginning of the run. You might notice something physical going on, like a sample uptake problem or read delay issues. Remember that the devil is always in the details. And with that, I'll thank you and open it up to questions. All right. All right. Thank you, Ryan. That was great. Um, so I guess we'll start uh, going through the questions. Um, just a reminder, everyone, uh, that you can uh, input uh, questions here uh, in the questions pane. Um, and we'll start to go through um, what was already submitted. Right. All right, Ryan, you ready? I sure am. <laughs> All right, so I'm just uh, reviewing some of them here. Um, one question was, for the organic samples, um, what uh, nebulizer do you prefer? 
Um, I'm usually using a gem cone nebulizer with organic samples, um, high solids gem cone or uh, uh, low flow gem cone. Um, mm -hmm. Usually low flow gem cone with the the organic samples because you want to limit what's going to your plasma specifically with those. Yeah, and that I believe is the nebulizer that comes in the organics kit, right? So yeah, um, yeah. So so if you have an ICPOES, uh, we we do have an organics kit that comes with the you know proper injector. I think it comes injector, spray chamber, and nebulizer is definitely in there, and I may have some. Uh, pump tubing as well for organic. Yeah, I believe it does have some pump tubing, yeah. and I think all of the instruments come with that pump tubing regardless, um, and it's really easy to switch out between aqueous sample intros and uh, organic sample intros if you're one of those labs that goes back and forth. Yeah, um, and then kind of along similar lines um, for organic samples, what internal standard did you use? And then uh, question was atrium and what brand so three yeah. parts <laughs> so, so um most of the time i i use our standards um but um for for yttrium is pretty common for aqueous samples but for uh organic samples it's generally cobalt um and you can find um particularly for you know if you're talking about oil type samples um, you can find uh, diluents that already have the cobalt internal standard mixed in with the diluent so um, that can be a really useful way to do that and um, we we have some in our catalog um, if you're yeah looking that, for a and that's, uh, yeah that's right and a lot of people have asked me well why do you use cobalt why don't you use yttrium for example and, and a lot of time comes to uh, again the chemistry in the stability of the element, right? In the, in right, the solvent, right. yep. as far as I've been told, to, I guess it was easier to stabilize the cobalt organometallic, you know, uh, uh, as an internal standard versus like yttrium or something else. Um, yeah, the, 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 the big important factors in terms of internal standards are that you have them stable and also that they're not present in your samples. Yeah. So, um, you know, those are the, the major things. So there may be some labs out there where the standard internal standards that most people use uh, don't work for them because they have cobalt in their samples or yttrium in their samples. And, and then um, the samples that have that will um, divert from the, you know, steady state, uh, steady intensities that you're supposed to be seeing with internal standard, which is kind mm -hmm. of the whole point of an internal standard. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and to pay, based on the matrix, we, we do have a whole variety of those elements in our uh, in our catalog uh, or yeah, online if you want to yeah. search through it or reach out if you can't find it. Um, the next question here, um, where do you find RSE? Ah, so um, that is a more recent addition to our software versions. Um, that would be um, in the software in, in Synjistics, if you have the versions that um, contain it, it would be on the um, uh, calibration edit, I believe, tab. I'm actually trying to look for my software right now just to get the exact name of it to make sure that I tell you the right thing. It, yeah, it's um, in the calibration yeah. edit. And it, edit calibration. I, yeah, edit calibration. Yeah. I believe it's also in the data viewer area on the calibration section, right? That is true. Yeah. That is Isn't true. Isn't it yes. there as well? Yeah. Yep. yep. Yeah. So if if you're but if it's you the saw latest this, version of software, right? Yeah. If you yeah. saw the screenshots um, on the slides, it would be on that edit calibration window in the um, table in the upper right hand uh, quadrant of that window. Um, so if you don't see that, uh, you might benefit from a software upgrade. Yeah, yeah. You may want to reach out to your your service engineer, or your application scientist uh, mm -hmm. as well. Um, next question: Any tips on phosphorus non aqueous? So I, I'm assuming the question means tips on phosphorus in non aqueous matrices. They're having issues with reproducibility. Um, obviously, that's a tough one without seeing the data. Yeah, um, I think with that specifically, um, more information would be needed, and I would encourage you either to reach out to your um, 
your service person or your application scientist or tech support um, with that, um, you'd be welcome to send me some information yeah. too if yeah, you just want. Some ideas off the top of my head. I mean, reproducibility in general, is it happening to everything or is it just phosphorus? You know, kind of that's kind of things you want to look at. Um, yeah, is it, is it a specific type of um, sample? You know, maybe yeah. with that in particular, you could be having issues with um, internal standards, kind of like we talked about in the slides. Uh, but yeah, if it's specific to phosphorus, you, know, you just look at when it's happening and when it's not happening and um, what might be different about phosphorus than the other analytes that you're looking at. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it can, yeah, that can be a tricky one, especially in non-aqueous, uh, do the you know, carbon effects. Sure, um, yep, yep. And then um, for an ICP used daily, uh, do you recommend frequently replacing the tubing and on what schedule or replacing only as needed? Yeah, so, um, for a situation like that, I would say probably you could just do it at the beginning of the shift, so like beginning of the day. Um, but you know, pay attention to your instrument. Um, as with most things, your mileage may vary. So um, you know, if you're starting to see towards the end of the day um, that you're getting increased uh, relative standard deviation from your replicates, um, you might end up needing to do it more frequently. Um, it does depend somewhat on you know how you have your your tension set on your on your clamps, like I mentioned um, during the presentation, you don't want too tight because you can mm -hmm. actually uh, wear your tubing more quickly. I, I um, see that a lot of people over tighten uh, yeah. those clamp those tensioners, and then will will cause actually a precision issue, actually make your precision right. worse and wear right. the tubing faster. Um, and also pay attention to um, the different types of tubing. So if you're plumbing in your internal standard, like into a mixing tee, uh, which means you would have on your pump tubing, or I mean on your parasaltic pump, you would have um, one tubing for the internal standard, one for the sample, and then a third for the drain. Um, the internal diameter of your internal standard pump tubing is generally smaller and can wear at a different rate than your sample tubing. So paying attention to that as well. Um, would be a, a good idea. Yeah, and also, I mean, the frequency will depend on you know how much acid is in the sample. Sometimes with a higher you know acid concentration, will chew up the tube being a little bit faster as well. Right, right. So there is there's, there's, there's definitely a variety of factors there. Yeah, but I would say um, you know a good indication is is looking at your uh, reproducibility. Yeah, good point. Yeah. Um. Anything, uh, I guess this customer is running HF or samples that contain HF. Any any mm. recommendations for HF resistant sample introductions? Yeah, so um, there are several options. One of them is one of the default options we have on the Avios or, or Optima if you have an older ICP OES from us. Um, and that would be the um, Right on Scott spray chamber, mm. um, which is like a kind of cylindrical shaped spray chamber that is opaque black polymer material, right on. Um, and uh, that's a pretty good that's my double pass. That's my favorite, personally. Yeah, I, know. Yeah, oh, yes. I would agree. You can um, drop that on the floor and it'll bounce right <laughs> back up and be fine. <laughs> yeah, they're, um, they're pretty indestructible, uh, good, you know, been used forever on these systems. Um, predate a lot of the some of the other styles but um, but it's not the only option if for some reason that doesn't work for you or or whatever um, you know there are uh, ones that are made from fluorocarbon there's, there's yeah. yeah yeah but certainly you don't want to do any uh, quartz or glass <laughs> yeah. chambers um, the standard um, injector the alumina does pretty well with um, HF so mm -hmm. um, so you shouldn't need to worry too much about that. Um, but again, you know, with the nebulizer, you wouldn't want to do um, a glass or a quartz nebulizer either. Um, so generally, most people, when they do those um, Scott spray chambers, they'll do a, a cross flow neb um, mm -hmm. that has um, uh, gem tips on each of the uh, tips that go into and, the, and peak, the spray chamber. And peak components as well, right? Right, right. right. Yeah, yeah, so they're, they're um, you know, uh, resistant to hydrofluoric acid. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, that's that's a pretty common matrix for 
uh, customers of ours to use on their system. So uh, we definitely have options. I, I yeah, I usually recommend starting with the the Crosslow Scott the right on chamber, right? And then you know we can tweak it. We can add a different, you know, maybe peak or PFA nebulizer as needed. Yeah, uh, it's it's a thing. it's a good general workhorse, all-purpose, cost-effective, you know. Um, option. So um, mm -hmm. that's generally what I recommend as well. Start mm -hmm. there, and if you need to adjust, then we can. Mm -hmm. um, I had a question on what is RBS 25 and how is it used to clean the nebulizer? I think it's a surfactant solution. Yeah, like I believe a, it like is too. Like a, um, like a kind of a soapy uh, solution. So, um, you know, generally you'd mix it with water uh, and and depending on your nebulizer, um, soak it or or run it through um, uh, like a, some of the nebulizers have little syringe setups that you can use to attach to them and, and mm -hmm. flush them that way. So it kind of mm -hmm. depends on your nebulizer. As I was mentioning, you know, you don't, you don't want to, <laughs> speak to uh, generally about all nebulizers because there's a lot of difference out there. So. Yeah, I think RBS is used in laboratories all over for cleaning Absolutely. glassware yep, and yep, stuff yep. like that, right? It's basically so, yeah. like lab Pretty soap, common. essentially yeah. lab soap. Yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. Uh, you can buy it most, uh, most vendors of lab chemicals and stuff. Yep. Um, okay, so that, it, it, the next question is, just read it, this one's a long one. Uh, if there appears to be elemental contamination between the probe and the nebulizer, is there a preferred method to try and wash out the contaminant? Example, um, uh, some sort of... So, yeah. it, you know, it, it, it is kind of dependent on what is going on, you know, what the contaminant is, um, mm -hmm. you know, some things, if you don't have hydrochloric acid, for example, in your, um, in your rinse solution, you know, adding that might help um, mm -hmm. increasing acid concentrations. But I mean, to be honest, occasionally the answer has to be just change out the tubing because um, sometimes you can clean it out, but it's not a time effective uh Good answer, point. You know, good. So, good. Yeah, yeah good point. point. Could take. Could, <laughs> could, could be easier just to sometimes replace the transfer lines than to yeah. fight it or to yeah. deal with yeah. cleaning it. And is it ever going to be perfect? It yeah. depends on what, what what's in there, right? R right, and, and some some analytes uh, require certain things to not stick to tubing. So, for example, if you're analyzing mercury, um, you know, putting some gold in there uh, will help keep it from clinging to the sides. Uh, so, it you know, it kind of depends on what it is that you're that you're seeing sticking around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and some sometimes. Um, I found that it really depends on sample type. So if you're running like environmental type samples and they're not really, you know, they look clean and so you run them straight, uh, but they're kind of, they, they've got some organics in there and they kind of coat the lines of the tubing and it's mm -hmm. not visual. You can't visually tell that these lines are contaminated or, or coated with anything, uh, but they are. And some sometimes they can be very stubborn to, to, to clean up so uh, I find there is a point where it's just not worth cleaning and just yeah. throw it out and, or, and, or. and Aaron you, you bring up a good point so we didn't really talk about like um, like the windows that are inside your torch compartment or anything but oh, yeah. um, a lot of times people will um, to you know see some loss of sensitivity or something like that and and uh, think, oh, maybe I need to, to clean my windows, and they'll look at them, and they say, oh, no, they actually look pretty clean, but you need to remember that not all of the wavelengths you're looking at are in the visible spectrum, and so they might uh -huh. actually be um, in need of, you know, cleaning or, or changing out um, simply because they're not transmitting uh, something in the UV, for example. So, Especially for something like phosphorus. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, you know, a, a good final check on a lot of these things or, or first pass maybe even is to have new components that you can switch out and if that solves the problem then you've located the issue and you know, hopefully you can just clean whatever it is that you needed to pull out but 
um, it may be necessary, you know, to to actually swap it out. So, you know, these, yeah. these are in in large part consumables, and so they will have a lifetime. Sometimes that lifetime is very very long, but um, you know, you do. Yeah, it depends what. Right. What you're putting in there, right? Exactly, um, exactly. You know, and, and it depends how clumsy you are. I've broken my fair share of glass things like windows and, and torches yeah. and nebulizers. So, yeah. I <laughs> think everybody's had that bad day when you knock something <laughs> off the the bench or the counter that you uh, probably yeah. shouldn't have. <laughs> yeah, or snapped a nab or yeah, stuff yeah, like yeah. that or scratched yeah. a window, trying to clean like optics windows and stuff and uh, yeah. oops, I scratched it. Yeah, uh, you know, follow the, um, the instructions in your um, user guide, your hardware guide that comes with your instrument. Um, and if you don't have a copy of that, sometimes they get lost. Um, you can always reach out to, uh, to us either through, you know, tech support or through your service engineer and we can get you, you know, a PDF copy um, so that you have all of those proper instructions of how to clean things. And um, yeah. All right. One, uh, I think uh, one last question here, Ryan, and then we'll wrap up. Um, is there a maximum concentration of nitric acid that can be introduced to the ICP? Hmm. Um, I think the highest I've gone is maybe 20%. Um, Aaron, have you ever done anything higher than that? It, it depends somewhat yeah. also on your components that you're using. There's, there's a variety of factors there. I mean, yeah, in general, uh, it's usually around 20 is kind of max. Um, I, I find as well on an ICP OES, and for most practical analysis, you know, and sample prep, right? By the end, there's not that much higher acid concentration out there. Sure, I mean it's it's certainly more common to do more like one to two percent. Um, you know, sure. maybe 5% being 10, 5, high end, like, like normal. Yeah, but yeah. Um, it, particularly for cleaning purposes, um, you know, sometimes you do need to go higher. It also depends on like how long you're planning on doing this um, because some things can handle, some sample intro setups can handle um, a higher concentration acid for a shorter period of time, uh, but you don't necessarily want to do it, you know, eight to 12 hours a day, seven days a week. <laughs> That kind of thing, mm -hmm. and it depends how it's set up. So if you're using, I find if you if you're pumping the sample through pump tubing, it'll beat up your pump tubing faster. Yes. If you're using like an HTS or high throughput system, and you're mm -hmm. using flow injection, it's a little bit better, right? Because yep. Yep. you're just loading it into the PFA loop and then pushing it out, and um, so the actual pump tubing isn't being exposed to that high high acid concentration so that yeah, yeah. so yeah you're, you're right it, it depends on how the system's configured um uh, especially on the and, front end and one thing that i would consider is why you're increasing the acid content that high if that's what your sample prep requires then that's one thing but if you're dealing with um plugs forming or or things that you're trying to clean out, the answer might not be a higher concentration of the acid that you're using. It might be a different acid or some other aspect. You know, maybe Good. you need to add yeah. uh, maybe you need to add an argon humidifier to your system so that you have um, moisture water being added to the uh, nebulizer gas so salting isn't occurring or something like but that. But if, if maybe you're a manufacturer of Concentrated acid. Right, <laughs> and, exactly. I don't know, you know? but yeah, so it, it, it would depend on you know what your analytical objectives are, and so um, we'd have to take a little bit closer look on that. But in general, the kind of rule of thumb is is usually in the the five to ten percent range, and then when you start getting above that, then usually kind of different precautions and so forth have to be taken. Is sure. my opinion, you know. Um, all right. Well, um, it doesn't look we have like we have. Oh, uh, just had a, one last <laughs> comment. It's used for sample prep at about thirty percent, thirty percent acid. I, mean, I you know, I, I'd I'd say it's probably okay. You're gonna just have you know wear of your of your of your sample tubing. Um, 30% nitric. Um, yeah, I mean, if, if you can dilute that, it's obviously going to be a little bit gentler on the system, but uh, it should be able to handle that. One yeah, thing yeah. you will want to consider, though, make sure that your matrix matching your standards, right? Right, um, absolutely. Because, uh, you know, at that 
your concentration, the, the viscosity, surface tension effects are definitely going to be there. Yeah, uh, um, that's that's a really good point. Um, you definitely want to matrix match your your standards along with your samples, um, particularly when you have something that's that uh, different from aqueous, uh, because your the way that your nebulization takes place, mm -hmm. you want to match that between your standards and your samples. And your internal standard will take care of some of that, uh, but you still want to you know, come as close as possible. A little bit of it, yeah, yeah but, yeah. Uh, you know, not like from like 2 to 30 percent. Right, exactly, exactly. Um, exactly. Um, and and yeah. there may be, you know, if you're seeing um, that that's kind of aggressive on your, some of your sample intro components, um, I would talk with your application scientists, and if you aren't sure who that is, we can put you in touch with them, um, to uh, your, your, you know, local regional area. Um, to give you some other options for you know what you might be able to use um, as an alternative to be a little bit more robust. Mm -hmm. um, and, and another thing is this is you you may want if you're pumping through pump tubing you may want to look at flow injection um, mm -hmm. that avoids some of the, the pump tubing issues. Um, that yeah, could... yeah, it's it's a little bit more of an inert um, sample path, so yeah, be a little yeah. a little more um, resistant to that aggressive acid. Yeah, content. exactly. Yeah. Okay, um, well, I just wanted to, you know, thank everyone. It doesn't look like we have any more questions. So I wanted to thank everybody for attending today's uh, webinar. It's uh, really good. Thanks, Ryan. Um, the note, the handouts are here. I had this up for a bit. Um, and uh, to locate all the webinars in this series, you know, please visit this link and you'll get it emailed to you as well. And you should have got it emailed to you during the registration. So as an attendee, you'll get all that information. And so thank you again, Ryan, and thank you everyone for taking the time to attend today's webinar. If you have any other questions, please reach out to us. Um, and once you leave today's webinar, you will receive a survey on the presentation, and we would appreciate if you complete that, provide your feedback. You will also receive a follow-up email in about 24 hours with a link to the recording of today's webinar and the certificate of attendance. So on behalf of Perk and Almer and our presenter, thank you for joining us today and have a great rest of your day. Thanks everybody. Thanks.